I don't know what those white people in this country feel. But I can only include what they feel from the state of their institution. Now, this is the evidence. You want me to make an act of faith, risking myself, my wife, my woman, my sister, my children, on some idealism which you assure me exists in America, which I have never seen. Welcome back to Black History for White People, a podcast where we educate, resource, and challenge white people about black history. I'm Brad, and on today's show are my co-hosts, Katina and Garen. Today's topic is Confederate Monuments. This is part two of the episode, so if you haven't listened to part one, make sure to go back in your feed and take a listen. We first meet up with Mr. Willie Hudspeth on the Denton Square to discuss the Confederate Soldier Monument that stood for over 100 years. We then go to Miss Ruby L. Cole's house to discuss her history with the monument and her experience living in Denton. We hope you enjoy the discussion. I'm interviewing in, interviewing Mr. Willie Hudspeth. Um, he is an activist, a minister of the gospel, um, a Vietnam veteran, and just... Uh, I don't know. He's just been, I've, I've seen him since I came to Denton on the Denton Access Channel, just always doing the work of activism, always compelling the city and the county to do right by children. I mean, he's been engaged in, in education um, and, and, and just all forms of activism. It's just been amazing to watch him over the years. And I will say that it's because of his work, 26 years 21 years 21 here, years here, but many more years. Since um, 70, 70, 80, 1980. Since sorry. 1980, of uh, trying to get this monument, the Confederate monument, down in Denton. Um, every Sunday, without fail, 4 to 7, comes and most often is alone, um, sits um, in the sun and the rain, whatever, with his signs. He lays out his display. Um, and has just pleaded with the city and the county to take down this monument. And it's been just a historic moment uh, a few weeks ago that they quietly, secretly came onto the square and took the monument down, not because um, it was the right thing to do, but mostly because they feared for the monument's safety, which we'll take it because it's gone. And so the next fight will probably be what they're going to do with it. But this is Willie Hudspeth, and we're just so grateful for you. So grateful for your work in Denton. And just want to hear your story. Okay. All right. Uh, it all started in 19... The statue part of it uh, in uh, 19... Probably... I guess the first... The first record of what I started doing was 1999. And it had to do with the fountains that were on this on this statue. And the water had been on at one time, I was told, and it corroded and and then they just left it off. I think partly because the information came out that it was for whites only, and they were embarrassed about that. And they didn't want to bring it back up, so they just ignored the the, um, commissioner who was going off and what she had said, let's do, which was, let's just turn the water back on. Well, they didn't want to do it, so that's where my journey began. The fight to turn that water back on and then to put a plaque on it that said what I thought should be written, which is only at one, I told them to put this on it. At one time, only one race could drink from these fountains. Now, all can drink from the fountains. This is after they turned it back on. Let's not ever let this happen again. And the commissioner's court in 2002, through my efforts of two years, three years rather, said, okay, we're going to do it. 
Judge Horn got on the commissioner's court as the judge. Mary Horn? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what was her the driving force behind her fighting against doing anything here, but it could have been anything. I don't know what it was. But she fought doing anything with that statue for years, ever since she was on the commissioner's court. Mm. They passed it. They passed. They were going to turn the water on and put the plaque on it in 2002. Mm -hmm. You can look at the records and you'll see where they voted to do that. She ignored it. She didn't bring it up. She didn't bring up the issue. She just did. She, it was as though nothing happened. Mm -hmm. She just kept on going. She never brought it up again. So that started the fight right then, 2002, 2003. Then I started saying, yeah, we're going to, we're going to take care of that statue. I want that thing gone. Okay. Finally got there about 2010. Mm -hmm. Let's get rid of the statue. Then when I heard somebody ask me, why do you keep going? Why do you keep going all those years? I heard through somebody that knew somebody that was on the commission court, Mary Horn had told him and all of them agreed, let's ignore him. There's mm. only one man, he's black, and we don't have to pay any attention to him. Wow. I did it. I played football and you don't you might not know what competitive sports do to you. <laughs> but they competitive sports says, hey, let's just play and see what happens. Yeah. Don't tell me we can't win the game. Let's play. And I came off a championship team where we won the state two years in a row with run up for the third year. Wow. That's my drive. You're not going to tell me that we can't do it. Then when you put my race in it and my gender is on. And she said. So now you got it. Oh, I well, know. Somebody said she said. Oh, I believe it. Yeah, I yeah. do too. Well, yeah. But well, whatever. Yep. When it got back to me, it was game on. Yep. So every w week. Now, what I had to learn, it really it started with, um, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, Charlottesville. Mm. That happened. They ran over the lady in, in demonstrating. Mm. And then the people came out in droves. Mm -hmm. Lots of people were out here then. And they were basically saying, I don't want to be remembered with that group, that hate group. I'm going to get out here and do something. Right. So they came out for uh, four days. Mm. It was back to normal. Yep. And so I learned right then, football again, competitive sports, I don't care who comes out here. Right. I'm going to be here. Wow. All of the, the large crowds left. It quieted it down, quieted down. And I just, I was sitting out there one day, and it was raining. And it was cold. Wow. I said, I don't care. Wow. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care. I had on a, I got a picture of it, too. My big old blank uh, sleeping bag was over me. Wow. I had on that, the, the worker's clothes where you, you keep yourself cool. The man couldn't even see me. You know what race I was. And uh, it was like coronavirus. It was out there. I was covered. <laughs> For two hours, I sit out there and I said, I don't care. And mm. it, from then on, it's the way I've been. So that's where I, what brought me to the other day, which I still didn't think it was going to happen. But now it has happened. And so tell us a little bit about some of the resistance that you encountered as you were on the square, like Sunday to Sunday, some of the crazy, and even maybe some encouragement and hope that you you got um, in your work to continue and be so persistent. I mean, I know that you were persistent because that's just your character. You had that fortitude. Um, you you know, you're not a quitter. But I I want to believe that there may have been some sparks of hope as there were as there was tons of discouragement. Right. So tell us a little bit about that. Okay. What I found by sitting out here every day mm -hmm. is God would tell me mm. stuff. Mm. And he'd say, all right, you want, I want you to do this. 
Mm. And I say, God, it just come in your head. You know, it just, mm. we, I know that to be the Holy Spirit. And he just talks to your mind. Yeah. And here's three things that happen out here to get, just help me go mm -hmm. and keep going. One was the guy that came, and they'd always tell me things like, they would say, why are you doing this? You should be doing this, or what about this? Why don't you do something about this? They'd always phrase it like that. Mm -hmm. And so three things that they did that to me, and what they were doing was informing me of other things that I need to look into. Mm -hmm. That's what they were doing. Mm -hmm. First, there was a guy who worked here black guy who was a slave mm. got his freedom yeah worked a good worker everybody loved him zach rollins mm -hmm. 20 years he worked here wow. there is no record of what he, he did wow and all that suffering and all that what he did no record at all somebody came up and challenged me he said what about jack rollins i said who is he i don't know anything about him then I found out what he did. I went to them and I said, you need to have something up here for Zach. No, no, I didn't say it like that. Why don't you have something up here for Zach Rowling? Well, they were taken the back as much as I was. And they were embarrassed. So they did. They went and got, they did. They spent $2,000 and, and create a plaque for Zach Rollins. Mm. Never put it up. Wow. <laughs> it's still in there somewhere, but it's never been put up. He's never been recognized. But that, you know, that, 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 so during the journey, these are the things that happen. Number two, there is a former slave cemetery. Somebody came up and challenged me with that. That challenge came along with what about women who are losing their children and, and aborting and all of this and the sickness oh, yeah. and, the, and they, they bring all of all it together. But then I heard about that slave cemetery in Pilot Point. Yep. Went up there, found it. Sure enough, it was in disarray and it was a mess. Yeah. And I found out that the county has money to take care of it. Hmm. They just don't. So I came up with information about that. Found the money. They're, they they voted to fix it. But this, this commissioner's court is evil. Yeah. Here's what they did. They said, we're going to spend $20,000 to redo that cemetery. Uh -huh. I said, yes, because I was up there by myself, again, by myself. Right. First, I started, there were 10 to 12. Then there were six. Then there were four. Then there was no more but me. Uh -huh. So I kept going up there, and the significance of that, that uh, cemetery is there was... There's about 400 bodies there. Mm. And 50 of them were in a, a section for kids. Mm. They were the ones who were born and they died, never, never lived to see anything in slavery. Mm. Uh, or it wasn't slavery, it was just right after slavery. Mm -hmm. And then some of them were sick, couldn't get medical attention, they died. And 50 of them were in, a, in this area. You can't find out who. Which ones is actually a body because they've used the sandstone to mark the spot and mm -hmm. they wrote on it, but it all disappeared. And so it just hurt me really bad. Oh, yeah. So when they bought it for the $20,000, and I thought, oh, right there now. But here's what they did. Like I said, they're evil. Mayor Horn, here's what we'll do. She didn't say this aloud. I found out later that uh -huh. this is what she done. Uh -huh. How many man hours would it take to actually fix that place? And what the fixing was, what it's like a, it's like a big forest. Uh -huh. and, and everything's grown up. You can't find the headstones. It's been vandalism, and it's just a mess. Oh, yeah. And so she said, how much would it take man hours to fix this? So they inflated how much it would cost to fix it. She said... Now, this, she did this in open court. I need a motion to put the, the $20,000 on, on that, in this endeavor, toward this endeavor. Mm. I thought, yes, $20,000 would do a great, be great. Yeah. What she did was she figured out how many hours it would take, said, okay, 
go to a maintenance man, grounds guy, go work on it, and then we'll we'll see how much it costs. And all they did was weed eat it around some of the trees. Wow. And and that was it. She said they were going to expend twenty thousand dollars, and what she meant was, we'll budget twenty thousand, then we'll start working. Well, they went up there and weed eated the darn place. They didn't do anything. That got me. That was number two. So well, I thought, and let me inter- interject. It sounds like what was happening was that as as the enslaved were losing their loved ones, they were laying out stomp. They were just doing anything they could to commemorate and remember. Um, and of course, that area was just neglected um, because it was they were slaves. And right. so um, that's why there were so many unmarked graves because, you know, just the effort that it would have taken that they were probably denied because black bodies um, don't have dignity and the death of black bodies don't, you know. Black bodies don't have dignity. Right, where, where people are... Historically, I mean, we see this throughout the scriptures, like historically, you know, there's a process of grief. There's a process to uh, lay your dead to rest. And we even see in the Bible where, you know, as an act of evil, people would not bury or not allow um, people to be buried just as an act of like, oh, this person's body doesn't even deserve to go in the ground. And so it sounds like that's what was happening. Um, just the stripping of dignity, even in death. Mm-hmm. So, two things happen after that we found out. Mm-hmm. When the Klan comes in and they terrorize the place, oh yeah, and there's nowhere to go. Yep. The authorities are on the side of the Klan. Yep. And so, they had given this black community um, this area, and they, they, they didn't think it was. They, they didn't want it. Mm-hmm. It was covered with rocks. It was not very easily accessible. So they told the slaves, you can live there. They wanted the slaves, freed the slaves, slaves to stay up here because it was a lot of farming and they yeah. could get work. The slaves, former slaves wanted work. They oh, needed yeah. the work done. They said, okay, you can live over there off of, off of James, I think it's, yeah, St. James Street. Mm-hmm. And so they did. Well, they, then they buried their, they, they have schools, they had church, they had a whole community. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, they were no more. Yep. They were gone. Yep. They left quickly. And we, we think it's a clan. The clan scared them off because they was a, it turned out it was a thriving community. Yep. They started really thriving, even in those hard, under those harsh condition, conditions. So what's left there now is the cemetery. That was a church. It was some schools, a school, and then all of a sudden they were gone now. And that's historically what's happened across the country. Thriving black communities um, after slavery had the audacity to thrive and do well but then were destroyed um, out of intimidation, just as an intimidation tactic, um, and then monuments and things that African-American communities would build or schools or whatever, they would just be demolished um, as, an, and even memorials, like when we think about Emmett Till's memorial, like the Klan will still go, this, this child has been dead for I don't know how many years, and they still go in the face like these different um, monuments. So they probably were messing with the cemetery, like just uh, you, what I call pissing on it, might as well say, <laughs> but go ahead. And so, but I found that God doesn't like ugly. Yes. And he, he keeps telling me, I got this. Yes. And he says, yeah, yeah, they mean it for evil and yes. they did evil, yes. but I got this. Amen. Jessica Luther Rommel. Yes. She uncovered the paperwork. Ooh, yeah. She's got proof, not hearsay. She's got the letters, the little notes they wrote to you. I don't know how she got them. Yeah. But I said, well, let's go. Let's print this. Let's publish this. Let's let them know that they owe these people a lot of uh, something for yes. what they did. 
Yes. And we found out that they moved the boundary marker down so that the ranch, the, the rich horse owners who bought the property and went around, built the whole thing around it, moved the boundaries. It's written down. So I said, let's go. Let's publish it. She said, no. We've got to find some of those people who are here because mm. they are rich. Oh, yeah. They, we, when we put that out, those heirs don't know it right now, but they have a lot of money coming to them. And mm. we can prove it mm. that it happened. Wow. So God is saying, you know, you mean it for evil, but I got something for you. The wealth of the wicked being stored Man. up for the righteous. Shit. Yeah. So, <laughs> Zach Rollins, that cemetery out there, some mm. of the things that came out of this effort. And the last thing was, it's, it's the thing that he's, he's even teaching me today, he meaning God. Yes. This new phone, newfound fame that you have, I want you to re use it right. Mm. Oh, and then as a side, Quaker Town was a same kind of community. Absolutely. It was put here, they, they gave him that old wetland down there that was flood Blood oh, prone yeah. and all of that, oh, yeah. they made it into a thriving oh, situation. Yeah. Gainesville, yep. I found out since I was up there last week, it was a thriving community. Mm -hmm. And it did the same thing to them, moved around. Tulsa, just uh, everywhere. So it happens. God's got a way of balancing things out. So he said to me, this newfound fame that you have, mm -hmm. you need to use it right. Amen. You better use it right, because I'm going to deal with you if you don't. Wow. So the the use it right is, he said, I want us all to come together. Mm. Get these people to come together. Mm. I want you to use it. Now, he don't want me to just say, let's come together. He said, you do it. Mm. You get together. You start doing what you're supposed to do. Amen. So, when this thing came down, hmm. I, it's, if you don't know anything about the Bible, I know you do. Gideon. Yeah. When God, Gideon was going to fight these, this enemy, mm -hmm. and he had maybe a thousand men. I don't remember how many he had, but the others had 3,000, 4,000, 30,000. And he was going to fight against them. And God said, you got too many. He said, yeah, what do you mean too yeah. many? They got 30,000, I got one. He said, you got too many. And then he said something right at the end of telling them, reduce the number. He said, I want you to win the battle and I want everybody to know that I did it because yeah. there's no way you could do it. Amen. That's what he says about this. I know when they did a GoFundMe and they gave me that day and the other things that they did because of the efforts that I had over the years, which I didn't think of it like that. Remember, my, I'm playing football. Yeah. So, so I said, okay, you show me what to do and I'll do it. So that's yeah. what came out of that effort. All of, And it's still things like that that happens every day. Well, and... Like I've said before, we're concerned about our communities and we're concerned about the disparities that have been created that cause these bottlenecks in our own culture. Right. Like the thing about sin and wickedness is that it doesn't just stop at the act. There's going to be residual of what happens. So the tearing down of black townships and the destroying, like taking away jobs and mass incarceration and all those things. Yeah. It creates a culture within our culture that we that that we've been left to address on our own, um, and it takes voices like yours and mine to speak to our culture, to speak within our culture, and and so yes, I, I love that. I love you know I've heard you say that human trafficking is is next, and um, just uplifting and edifying and it, exhorting our people. Um, I know that North Texas has a growing human trafficking uh, issue. And so it's just it's just so funny. Like, you're not done. You're just moving on to the next thing. I'll be here Sunday. Oh, yeah. Five to seven. I love it. And what are you doing? <laughs> you're going to have your signs about human yep, trafficking? Yep, right here. Well, and the other day, you and I were um, at the city police, um, yeah, yeah. at the uh, station doing the assimilation um, because we're both serving on the ad hoc committee right. with the city council to review excessive force policies. And so you're doing that. Yeah. Um, 
And I just love it. I love it because I feel that a prophet's work is never done. Um, you know, they, they go on to glory having, like they, they spend their life, they dedicate their life, commit their life to doing the unpopular, uh, uneasy, uncomfortable work of the Lord. People have this misnomer that Christianity is one, especially in America, of comfort and ease and God wants me to do be be happy and it's like no he wants to, you to be as un uncomfortable as possible um and 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 his power is on display the more uncomfortable uh that you are the more on the fringe that you are and so yeah, my son and something that you said just now makes me i know what i need to do next mm -hmm. you he said my son he said okay you went to games all right you went to pilot point now you have left those people alone and you got them all riled up <laughs> and you have, what do you want? You need to do something. Mm. And I thought, dad, gummies, right? Well, what do you do? Well, I got to thinking, in Pilot Point, mm -hmm. I'm gonna meet with the elderly group, which mm. is two people, mm. and the young kids who started up those rallies, which yes. is about four people. Yes. And we're going to sit down and plot a strategy. Wow. What can you do? Wow. We're, we're through walking up and down these streets yelling. Yeah. What are you going to do? What? And, and my son said, you need to help them. Wow. Man, I got, I got over 40 years of doing this. Yeah. That's called wisdom. Yeah. He said, you need to help. You know all the stuff you did that was wrong and you, you now know you shouldn't have done it that way? He said... Now teach them, mm. teach those seven people mm. how to do it. And in Pilot Point, City Council. Mm. We're going to go to city, and it, it won't be but two. It but it was just two, you. That's right. <laughs> It'll be two people. That's the way it starts. And one of the issues that we can do something about mm. is the fact that they've got all the drainage going to the black neighborhood. Mm. Oh, no, we, we pay taxes. And if wow. we handle that right, we can get that drainage fixed. Oh, yeah. In Gainesville, same thing. There'll be maybe five of us, older and younger together, and me, mm -hmm. sitting in a room somewhere saying, what can we do? We're not going to go around this building anymore. Well, mm -hmm. I'm, that's what I'm telling. I ain't doing you no good. Right. Do something. Mm -hmm. So what is it that you do? Get involved. S school in system is awful. Yeah. Blacks are sent to these darn special ed classes just to get rid of them. Mm. The parents are scared. They don't go up there and talk for their children. The kids are angry. And that's what reminded me of what you said earlier. You said the results of the white establishment and the power has kept these people down so long they got to do something. So now you're getting the results of yeah. being oppressed. Oppressed. So, yeah. And, but, but God said to me, okay, the children of Israel were, were oppressed. Yeah. Get yourself up off of you. Because I felt my knees was on the ground. My hands was like this. Yeah. He, said, he said, get up. Wow. And Moses kept saying, but I can't talk. I don't know how to talk. He said, who made the mouth? Who made yeah. your mouth? Then Moses didn't hear. Hallelujah. He still said, I, I, I can't I tell. Can't so he sent Aaron. He just told me, get up mm. and let's go. Mm -hmm. Now, here's one thing that I've learned, and I'm going to tell him this too. Mm -hmm. As you're doing this stuff that you do, mm -hmm. don't you forget the main thing you were put here first to do. And that's your wife, your kids, mm -hmm. and your grandkids. Yes. Don't eliminate them for the, in the name of I'm going to help the world. Right. That's where pastors mess up. That's where they mess up. They need to just stop preaching all the time and keep themselves at home. Just stay at home and watch a show. <laughs> Quit thinking you got to go up there all the time. Now, yeah. You know, yeah. and we mess up. Absolutely. So, you know, PK's kids, you know what happens to Oh, them. yeah. Mad as hell, and they just start doing whatever they want to oh, do. Oh, yeah. Oh, so yeah. he told me, don't forget about that. Because he said, in so many words, why do you think the people kept worshiping idols after they've seen all that I've done? Mm -hmm. Well, I finally figured it out. They didn't talk to the kids <laughs> when they were growing up. Them yeah. jokers, they just 
kept him around and he did, they didn't tell him why they didn't yeah. do it. Yeah. You got them kids these, yeah. like these two. See? Ain't no telling what they got on their minds. <laughs> I bet they're they're blown away by listening to you. And it's so funny because you drove up and your son Gerard is running for mayor, and yeah. you talked about being there for your kids. Yeah. I've heard him talk about his father with so much love, respect, and admiration. And he's running for mayor of the city of Denton. That's you. That's that's your legacy. That's your work. And your truck is just covered in signs <laughs> and advocation for your son. And, and he, so he and, yeah. the, and the rest of my kids yeah. went with me to those school board meetings. Oh yeah. When I got elected to the school board, mm -hmm. they came with me. Oh. They were in that audience, so they just seen it all the time. Oh yeah. But then God said, you need to don't go to that meeting tonight. Go to his game. Mm. Christmas. Get on the floor with him yes. and play with that, those toys. Didn't have much money. Just play with him with yeah. the toys. Let's go on a vacation. You know what the, the vacation entail? Get in a car and driving 30, 40 minutes somewhere and going to Ray Roberts. I remember we went to yes. Ray Roberts Lake and up there to, and Oklahoma. Love it. Had the best time you could you could have. And so I'm just, you can't You have to let, balance it. You, you really do. Yeah. And the kids are very important. And now my kids hear all that information and they have no excuse. And boy, I got some, I got some messed up kids. <laughs> but I did the best I could do. And they all love me and I love them. We just have to just deal with life. So yeah. that's where we are. Well, uh, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned earlier, you just kind of uh, said in passing that they gave you a day. And I understand that as a reference that uh, Denton uh, dedicated June 9th to be Willie Hudspeth Day. Right. So I was wondering, uh, how would you like to see that day uh, celebrated or commemorated moving forward? One of the things that I've learned in this whole process is that we keep separating ourselves from each other. Mm. Here's how I want to commemorate. In fact, I offered that to them the night, that night and, and heard, heard later from someone that they, she was joking. And mm. I said, I'm not kidding. I want you to come to my house and eat with me. She's mm. white. That's how I want that day to be remembered. Mm. Get with another race and do something. If it's just going to the park, letting the kids play and sitting there doing nothing. Get with somebody of a different race and just chill with them. That's how I want the day remembered. I love it. And uh, one other question for me. Um, we have an audience of uh, thousands of white people are going to hear you right now. So what would you want to say to them as, as like a parting words, a send off? Um, what would you tell our audience? Uh, it, we, we all need to get together and work on some things together. Mm -hmm. But what the little bitty kids that come up here when I'm here and the older white people mostly come up here, they'll ask the question, what can I do? Now here's how the little kids, the seven, eight, nine, ten year olds will say that. They're asking that question, but here's how they ask it. Why do white people, this is what the black kids say, why do the white people want to kill me? Mm. And whites will say, why do y'all, why do y'all hate us so much? Mm. And know what the problem is. You don't know me. You think I'm like somebody else that's somewhere over here, and that's not me. So the white audience, it's so simple. We try to make it a big thing, because you know what we think? We think national national uh, involvement. Mm -hmm. We want to deal with things on a national basis, and we want to fix everybody. White audience, black audience, I don't care who it is that's listening to me. Here's what you do. I had this lady come up, she was talking to me, and she she said that she's a librarian here in the middle school. Mm -hmm. She said, what can I do? I got to thinking what I did as a middle school teacher. Mm -hmm. I said, write a note to that kid that you see, and it just enters your mind, he needs to know. And here's what you put on the note. I hope you have a good day. Mm -hmm. Or, I like you. Or, I'm so glad you came to my class. Or, I saw you today. And you just give it to him. 
You don't say, it's because I'm holy and I'm spiritual and I need somebody to recognize that I am. I've got a ring at home that I was given to remind me to stay humble. It's a big old ring. It's cheap. It's <laughs> green. It's green. Is that big? And I put it on every once in a while and like I hold it around for people to kiss it and bow down to me. <laughs> <laughs> you are so wild. <laughs> <laughs> I have it to remind me, you ain't nothing. You're, you are nothing. I'm the one that's, that, that you should be bowing down to. So it just reminds me. So that audience, get involved. Simple ways. When you go into Sam, let the other person go in before you. you. You're waiting in line. Try not to look irritated and, and angry about that I'm having to wait and all it. Uh, oh, here's the big one. Call your mother. <laughs> if she's the one that you have the most trouble with, call her and say, I love you and I miss you. Mostly it's the dads mm -hmm. that you had to call him. And so, and, and that, that neighbor that, ooh, you don't like him. His trash can is knocked over. Go pick the thing up. Don't go down. <laughs> don't do like I do. Knock on the door and say, you see your trash can is knocked over? Now I'm going to go pick it up. Now you better be, be appreciative. <laughs> he yeah. said, no, you don't do that. Just pick it up. Yeah. So that audience that you did, that, that, that uh, might be listening, let's get the ball rolling. Oh, and go to the most segregated time in our country to a church that's a different race. Go to that church. Sit your little old self down and just be in the, in the midst of that. Yeah. Oh, and the one that I have most trouble with, I had something in my, uh, in my storage room and I thought for sure I put it on this shelf. My wife said, it is not there. I said, well, it's on the shelf. I put it there. I know it was there. I know it was there. It's not there. When it turns out she was right, I put it somewhere else. The most difficult time I have is go back to her and say, mm. you're right. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. That's where it starts with us married people. Right oh. there. So that's what I would do. Thank you so much, <laughs> Mr. Yeah. Willie Hudson. Right. We love you and we respect you, honor you. Can't wait to share um, this episode with our listeners. Um, and we just, we're just grateful for you. Grateful for you, grateful for your work. And this is Miss Ruby Cole. And are you, where are you, are you from North Texas? I'm actually originally from Memphis, but we all live in Denton, Corinth. Oh. I live in Denton, North Denton. They live in Corinth. No, I was Corinth. wondering if you were students here. I came um, in the 90s as a student, and we stayed. I, I, you probably have seen me around, um, I, you know, because I sing, and so I've sang at Moore Street, and I go to, I used to go to Antioch over in Corinth Pastor Respice, and I've sang at Pastor Chambers Church, and um, just the different black churches around here, and at Juneteenth, and yeah, so I'm, oh, I know I've that we, seen yeah, you we, oh, I've seen you, and at the American Legion, and mm -hmm. yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, yeah. so, but um, we're just so grateful for you to make time for us to come and visit with you. Well, I don't mind. Yeah, we appreciate it so much, and we value your story because you have um, a long history here in Denton, and just you've lived through um, just different phases of, of racism in this country. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jim Crow and just how Jim Crow evolved from the early, like, because what year, do you mind sharing what year you were born, Miss Ruby? Uh, 1933. So, yeah, so you know, um, and you probably had grandparents who were slaves or great-grandparents. I probably did, but I, oh, well, as a matter of fact, yes, on my mother's side, mm -hmm. When the slaves were freed in Virginia, mm -hmm. um, her great grandfather settled in Texas, in East Texas. Mm -hmm. And so that's how long my, but I don't know the history of all of them because I'm still trying to find someone still living mm -hmm. who may have a picture of my mother's daddy. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. I do have a picture of her mother. Mm -hmm. But I haven't so far. And we have family reunions every two years. I still haven't come across mm -hmm. any relatives who can provide that with me. Yes, ma'am. Uh, but, uh, no, and I've been in Denton. I was born in Ponder. You know where that oh, is? Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay, I was born in Ponder. Mm -hmm. And when I was six years old, we moved to Denton. My parents did. My family did. My uh, the, my sister and, and my two sisters and one brother were triplets. Oh. And they were born in Denton County. That's on record. Okay. 1937. Yes, ma'am. And uh, we all grew up in Denton. Mm-hmm. Uh, we all finished, uh, you know, finished an all-black school, which was Fred Moore. Yes, ma'am. From elementary school all the way, we had that school you see up there. Yes, ma'am. It was always one location. Yes, ma'am. And so we went from elementary school to high school, graduating from high school there. And I laugh and say all the time, there used to be hills up there. Mm. And we call this the Red Hill. Ah. And the first black student at North Texas Mr. E.T. Miller, uh -huh. was, uh, he was one of the teachers there. Oh, and wow. he was from Denton. Wow. And uh, he, uh, he used to take us out at recess, little kids, and we would jump off those little hills and he would catch us. Hold on, let me, let's pause and let the, I'm on, let the oh. clock. <laughs> let it fit. <laughs> so yeah. we can make sure that we get you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is so cool. Okay. Okay, so tell us again, you said the first, uh... uh, uh yes, Mr. Miller, A.T. Miller. Yes, ma'am. Was the first black, and he was a graduate student, who went to uh, uh, North, North Texas, Texas State where he was integrated. Yes, ma'am. And uh, he, he was the coach at the time. Mm -hmm. And at recess, he would take all the little kids, and we would uh, outside, and we would drop, jump off that hill, and he would catch us. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but uh, and I asked him when he came here and started the school uh, if he remembered some of those things. Oh, he said, "Oh yes, I do remember all of that." Mm -hmm. But it was a lot of fun. We were all like I say, one building was elementary. Mm -hmm. We really didn't have a middle school. Mm -hmm. You just went from elementary. And then when we got in about the fifth grade, sixth grade, mm -hmm. we went to high, uh, high school. Okay, okay. And I remember our principal didn't even have an office. His desk was his office in his classroom. Wow. So, uh, but those are fun memories. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I tell everyone, before integration, Teachers weren't making a lot of money, but that day did not end with uh, the end of school day. Mm -hmm. They had to go into the homes and visit mm -hmm. and see what you were doing. And I look at these kids walking up and down the street, and I see this all the time because the park is just right, right down there. And I thought, boy, when we were coming home, we didn't have that leisure time. Yeah. We had work to do before we went to school. Yeah. We had work to do when we came from school. Yeah. And so they've never had it so good. Right. Mm -hmm. But we made it. And um, of all of us, uh, we all went to college. Yeah. And, however, we couldn't in the summer. Uh, my sister, I don't know whether or not you know Miss Kimball. Yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. She and I used to work in North Texas when they didn't have uh, cafeterias. They had boarding houses. All right. And what we did, uh, you know, the food was served on the table. Yes, and what we did, we'd go out and we would serve the food at all. Okay. And, uh, uh, you know, we would replenish the dishes as they were uh, emptied when they were eating. And then we would, when we would leave work, we would walk back to Denton, downtown Denton. Mm -hmm. There was no shopping malls. 
just downtown Denton. And we laugh about all the time when this heat is now, is that we used to, we would leave North Texas at 1 o'clock and walk all the way to Denton, to downtown Denton. And then we would, we would um, go to, we would uh, just walk around the square. And they had the five and dime store. We didn't have much more money to spend than that. And we would usually get home around five in the evening. That's how much time we spent there. But all those are fond memories. Yes, ma'am. And then I think about, you know, I've been reading about uh, um, removing that statue. Yes, ma'am. Now, when we were kids coming along, we thought nothing of that statue. We didn't, and there were, I've often read that there were water fountains, but they didn't work, but that's not true, they did. However, we did not drink out of those fountains. We consider them nasty because <laughs> we would see these, uh, uh, these men who, uh, who uh, chew tobacco, mm -hmm. and they were spitting those fountains. That's why we wouldn't. Uh, we would never, uh, 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 but we were not. We, uh, all this time, we couldn't in the stores like Woolworth and all. We couldn't. We couldn't get a drink of water from the fountains. Really? Oh uh, no! And that no. is because why is that? Because of segregation. Oh, and I, I mean, uh, and, and, and you know, in other words, uh, they had signs up there, whites only. Mm -hmm. You know, to drink, so we didn't want to drink from them anyway. Right. And I, I, I think about uh, when I read about, you know, all this fuss about removing it, not to remove it, and people ask us about us, so we didn't pay it any attention mm -hmm. because we decided ourselves that we didn't want to drink because you look at them and you see where they spit tobacco. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> and were they black and white, or were they whites only? Or whites only. Because they tell the lie that there the was a sign, white side. The in sign was there that said uh, whites only. Right. And uh, you couldn't, uh, in anything that you, uh, like the drug stores, you couldn't go, couldn't sit down at the fountain and all. You could go in and order, uh, maybe say a drink like lemonade, Coke, or something like that, but you were not allowed to sit at the fountain. Mm. So we went through all of that, but we made it through. So what was that, what did that feel like? I mean, it sounds like, and I hear this so many times from our elders, um, that they just made a life out of made lemonade out of lemons and just you know stuck to their communities and tried to mind their business and live their lives and thrive and do well we did and uh but i can always remember that on marsh street mm -hmm. across from uh Marsh Street Church. Yes, ma'am. That two-story house? Yes, ma'am. Okay, whites lived in that house. Really? Uh-huh, and Mr. Thomas, and he had a grocery store out on Hickory Street near North Texas. Okay. And, uh, but uh, at the time, this, uh, when whites lived in that house, and this uh, woman, she was a teenager, and she eventually married a doctor. Mm -hmm. who was Dr. Whitehead, and he had this Elm Street Clinic that was right across from where the bus station used to be and where that trophy house is now. Yeah. And uh, uh, when, uh, when every, su every summer when there was, we had Juneteenth celebration in the park, mm -hmm. she came down and, boy, she would do, it was, there was another it was called the Little Park over on the street behind St. Andrew's Church. Yes, ma'am. And, uh, but anyway, she would come down and, boy, would she, there was a little platform there, and that was called the Little Park. And, boy, could she dance. And I read, uh, it's been about, about 10 years ago that she passed away. Mm -hmm. But she always came. I mean, we got along. 
you know, we, uh, but uh, it was just, uh, you know, people had lived in Denton for so long and they knew, you know, the whites, they knew us and, mm -hmm. and, and, and we knew them. So mm -hmm. there was never any problems, mm -hmm. you know, uh, with race relations. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was just that, you know, it's kind of attitude that uh, you stay in your area, right. we'll stay in ours. Right. And I think all the time now I get so sick of getting phone calls, and I mean it's all day long. <laughs> People calling, wanting to buy your property when oh, yes. people didn't even want to come in this direction. Yes, ma'am. And uh, but I know what the and, and I know what the idea is. You can buy this property cheap. Yep. And then you know you, you, you can make a mint out of it because it's gentrification. Uh, and see, all oh, this whole area was uh, it was only uh, black community. Yes, ma'am. But now, there are four people on this side of the street that are blacks. Mm -hmm. On the other side, there's one, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. There's a total of eight people in this area. Mm -hmm. Everybody else, I mean, our, our, our street is uh, com almost completely integrated. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I, now the people who live directly in front of me, I don't know. They've been living there for about four or five years. They've never spoken to me. Mm. And uh, I, I see them. Yes, ma'am. But uh, I, I don't know who they are. And I, there was a Hispanic family that lived next door to me before they moved. Yes, and I... Uh, I, the, the young man came over and he told me one day, he said, uh, I noticed that you live by yourself. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, I want you to know I have cameras around my house and I have one pointed at your house cause, because I watch over there. And I said, well, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then when I broke my ankle and had to go live with my son and his family in Korea because mm -hmm. I couldn't... Uh, you know, couldn't do uh, uh, for myself. Yes, and one day we came from the doctor's office and he was there, he saw me and he came over and he said, I, I noticed I, uh, that you'd been gone. I said, yes, I tried to call you and I never could get in touch with you. He said, but I have continuously watched your house, you know, and I said, well, I appreciate that so much. And I told him, I remember when we were growing up, we never locked the door. Mm. Right here and then, and I said, you could go out of town, mm -hmm. not lock a door, and you could come back, and your place was just like you left it. I said, but now, mm -hmm. I don't even, uh, I, I don't even walk from my door without locking my doors. Yes, ma'am. And I, it's been about, Two months ago, my grandson's bicycle was almost up to my back door from my garage. Broad open day, and I happened to walk in the back and I came back. His bicycle had been stolen, mm -hmm. and we never found it. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, you just can't. It's, it's so much that goes on in your neighborhood. You just can't afford to not lock your doors. Yeah. And, uh, it's uh, not that community feel that it used no, to have. No, it, it is not. Yes, now, my neighbor on this side, uh, they, they watch out, you know, for me now because they know I live alone. Yes, ma'am. But uh, I, uh, you know, it's just not as safe as it once was. Yeah. Uh, and I tell everyone, when I was growing up in Denton, I... So uh, when I finished high school, is when I really realized what the uh, delinquency was, mm -hmm. and uh, because we just didn't have it. Mm -hmm. And I say one thing though, parents. Uh, I know in our neighborhood, when our parents left home, or especially our mothers, whomever the mother was left in the community. In, in, on the street, she became 
the mother of the street. Of the community, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and whatever, they could correct you. Oh, yeah. But now you really can't you say can't anything to these kids. Mm -hmm. Uh-uh. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I can just see the differences. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's, it's just been such a... And I, I tell you, um, I... My husband was a retired service man, mm. and uh, we we spent three years in Hawaii. And at the time, I took some classes at the University of Hawaii. All right. And uh, I, uh, you know, the, the, it's like a caste system there. Yeah. And uh, but I would I had I met this a uh, friend. Uh, well, it was a classmate. I met her, and she was from Mississippi. Mm -hmm. She's white. And uh, she told me, say, you know, I just, uh, the minute I open my mouth, you know, I'm ostracized because of her broke. And uh, so, but anyway, we got to be real good friends, and we would be together on the campus. And uh, some of the people there, you know, uh, class, uh, that I took class with would see uh, us together. And then when they would see me by myself, they said, how can you be, how can you be friends with her? You know the way they treat you. And they wouldn't say, uh, in the United States, they'd always say state size. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so I uh, not always say, well, I always treat people the way I want to be treated. And I felt like, I really felt sorry for her because she really didn't have any friends. And uh, and we corresponded for a long time, you know, after we came back to the States and all. And then I told him, I said, you know, my first job after I was in uh, finished school was in Dallas. And it was at a community center, mm -hmm. and my director was from Red Banks, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And then I asked, do you know where Red Banks is? And I don't know. I said, well, that's where Emmett Teal was killed. Mm -hmm. And I said, I've never met a person that was any more, I mean, she, uh, that woman was so, so sincere. And so, and I kept up with her until she died. And I remember one time we were coming from North Carolina and my son was three months old. Mm -hmm. And I told my husband when we got to, at the time she was in Macon, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And I told my husband two o'clock in the morning. I said he was gonna stop and get gas. And I said, well, I'm gonna use the phone. I'm gonna, I'm gonna call her mm -hmm. and wake her up. And, and tell her I need to come by and fix formula for my child. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, no, no, you're not going to do that to that woman. I said, yes, I am. And I called her, and sure enough, she gave me her, gave us her direction how to get to her. I went, she got up at 2 o'clock in the morning. That's the last time I saw her. But, I mean, she was really a sincere friend. And when she said she was a Christian, she was a Christian. And so let me just, I want to unpack this a little bit because some of the things that I've heard you say is just how, as black people, you existed and took up space and you lived um, as if life was uh, open to you, even though in some ways you knew it wasn't. But at the same time, when you had opportunities to be, especially with your unique experience having been in Hawaii, where you uh, weren't the majority, but you weren't the minority, you were somewhere in the middle racially, and this white woman was definitely the minority and right. was looked poorly upon, mm -hmm. but instead of treating her the way you and people like, that look like us were treated, you treated her with uh, the golden rule according to the scriptures and that's something that's always been amazing to me and you know my watching my elders and how and listening to their stories is that every opportunity that they had to repay uh, the indignity and repay uh, 
the hatred and racism, they would do the opposite. They would always respond in love. And many white people in our uh, in the cities and the towns and in the communities would find places of refuge with the black community and receive love and honor in ways sometimes that they wouldn't even receive from their own community because many times white people would be outcast for being poor or for being you know having scandal and black people would always receive them and make a place for them mm -hmm. even though that's often not wasn't reciprocated mm -hmm. and so I just all you know that just makes me um, just so proud as a black woman um, because you know black people we we have responded with such kindness and grace mm -hmm. and love when we could have responded in other ways and even in segregation and how uh, protests were approached peacefully Dr. King and just that peace and, and John Lewis um, I mean to know their stories and know how they were beaten and you know I've, I've been looking at pictures of John Lewis where they had him by his feet and his hands and you know beat him bloody like almost killed the man put them in prison and in his uh, mugshot he smiles mm -hmm. um, and he talks about stirring up that good trouble and and that's what I think about as you're talking is that that you know you you, you your generation changed the world for my generation just by stirring up good trouble and living according to the golden rule and loving those who hated you and um you know just just as the scriptures you know doing well towards those who persecuted you um and did even not repaying evil for evil mm -hmm. um and so that's just amazing to me the testimony of resilience and um just the the beauty of um, African American, specifically African American, African American Christians in America during the time of Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very that's powerful. The, and that's the thing, you know, we were taught that you, ex, uh, you know, you don't judge a person by the color of his skin. Mm -hmm. And uh, and one thing that you know, I think a lot of people just don't realize, color is only skin deep. Mm -hmm. And uh, that all of us are the same in the sight of God. You know, yeah. we, there's no uh, no special anyone. We're all the same. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what got the civil rights movement through. And I keep hearing that, um, you know, for, it was John Lewis who... Uh, Lyndon Johnson mm -hmm. uh, came up with the Civil Rights Act and all. Yes. And, uh, and, and you know, that's something else I got to see in person. Dr. King, mm. um, Andrew Young, yes. uh, John Lewis, and I'll show oh, Rum Shelwer. Yes. And the way this happened was that I, it was during time I was at the University of Hawaii, and they came over to Hawaii, and they spoke in that uh, uh, amphitheater there. Yeah. And I happened to be sitting about three steps from the aisle that they came down, and there were very few uh, black people at the University of Hawaii at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. King, when he came down that aisle, he spied me and he came across and shook my hand. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, one of the highlights of my life. I thought mm -hmm. I would never ever see that, but I did. I wow. got to see him in person. And uh, oh, Jesse Jackson was with them too. Yeah. And so I, all of those people, and I say now today they they're having uh, uh, John Lewis's uh, funeral. Yes, ma'am. I think it starts at twelve thirty. Yes, ma'am. But uh, I, you know, I I think I I got to do a lot of got to see a lot of things that uh, I'm I'm proud that I was able to see. Yeah. And like now, when my son came on, uh, that's the last year that 
Fred Moore in the elementary for the school was over. Mm -hmm. That's when they closed. Yeah. And uh, they, what they did, they selected 30 children from this area and sent them to Woodrow Wilson, yes. all grades. Yes. Woodrow, Real, Woodrow Wilson was where the, uh, you know, the professors at North Texas and TWU and the doctors and all, where their kids went. Yes. And I even had a teacher call me and say to me that um, they just don't know how to teach black kids. Hmm. And I said, well, you teach them like you teach all other kids. How about that? And then I had the music teacher call me and told me that my son would, would not sing. And I said, well, I said, I don't doubt that. I said, I'm not musically inclined. But his father uh, sung a little bit. I said, but, uh, you know, don't hold that against him. Right. And then she said to me, Black children have a chip on their shoulder against white teachers. Wow. And, and my reply to her is not that black boy of mine. And so she said, and then I proceeded to tell her, I said, do you realize that he was three years old before he saw a black child? Hmm. So no, I didn't know that. I said, okay, he was. And I told her, I said, he had never been taught you know, to make a difference with anyone. And, uh, but see, I, he was in the Cub Scouts and, and the, the lady that was over the Cub Scouts' husband was a Unitarian minister. Mm. And uh, I, I went to pick him up one day from her house and she was telling me about this music teacher being so friendly. Mm. But I told her, I said, but you know, I can tell you what your problem is. And she said, what is that? And I said, you're prejudiced. And she said, oh, no, 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 I'm not prejudiced. I said, yes, you are, but you don't recognize the fact that you are. Wow. Okay, my son finished high school, finished college, and when he got ready to, uh, to get married, and the announcement was in Denrock Chronicle, and she saw it, and I have today this card that she sent to my son congratulating him. Hmm. And she wrote on that card, tell your mother I said hello. Hmm. And I know that has bothered her. Yeah. And, and But she called me after I told her that a year later, and she told me that uh, she had been searching herself, and she said it hurt me what you said to me and I said the truth does hurt <laughs> so well thank you so much we're gonna get well, out of here quite welcome. Here, and we, we appreciate you you've given us so many gems and so many uh, pearls of wisdom and, oh. so, and I love hearing your stories they've been such a blessing to hear like you know that's the thing about that we're black people have so many stories and so many experiences and people put us in all these little boxes and they would never think that a black woman who lives in black Denton, mm -hmm. you know, has been, has had all of this amazing uh, education and had all of this influence in our city, mm -hmm. moving behind the scenes with the police chiefs and the mayors and the teachers and making things happen. It's, it's really powerful. Um, but that's who we, like, for me, hearing your stories like listen to my grandmother or my great-grandmother or aunties or like this is not this is normal to me mm -hmm. but i love I'm, I'm so grateful that we get to share this with um, an audience because we need to amplify black voices and it's specifically our elder black voices people need to hear your story so we thought we'll be we'll be calling on you again Thanks for listening to part two of this episode. If you haven't listened to part one, make sure to go back and take a look in your feed. If you're looking for more information on what we discussed, take a look at the show notes or go to blackhistoryforwhitepeople.com. If you'd like to play a supportive role in the podcast, for $5, you can vote for future topics, listen to unedited interviews, submit questions, and more. Check us out at patreon.com backslash blackhistoryforwhitepeople. Remember that all the money that you give in these first 10 episodes will all go to the Denton African American Scholarship Foundation. Our next episode, we will be discussing redlining. We'll leave you with this quote from Lecrae Moore. If you live for people's acceptance, you'll die from their rejection. <laughs>